Let us say a quick prayer. Giver of all good gifts, make us a vessel of grace and joy to all who need it. Amen. Well, I was uh, at uh, Panda Express recently uh, to pick up food for Cordy and myself, and uh, I was in the drive through line uh, about an hour before close, uh, and the order went like this. I said, hi, yes, I'll take a bowl with chow mein and Beijing beef. She said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but we're out of Beijing beef, so if you want that, you'll have to wait about 15 minutes. I said, oh, that's okay. Uh, I'll take the black pepper chicken then. And she said, uh, I'm sorry, sir, we're out of that too. And uh, I said, uh, no worries. In that case, I'll take the honey and walnut shrimp. To which she replied, I'm afraid we're out of that too. Uh, it might be better if I just tell you what we do have. And I laughed and said, yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds like a good plan. Uh, you know, I've worked in restaurants, so I know how things go, uh, especially when you're about to close. Uh, and even restaurants run out of things. Uh, well, switching gears and thinking about what it's like to host a meal for others uh, in your home or, or even in the church, uh, it somehow feels very important to have enough food for, to feed everyone, right? Like, we usually make uh, more than we need just to be on the safe side. Uh, and if you ever find yourself in a position uh, where you might be short on something, uh, it can leave you feeling panicked uh, or embarrassed uh, or both. Well, that is, in fact, exactly what happens in today's story at the beginning of the Gospel of John. As we step into the pages of chapter 2, we find ourselves with Jesus, his mother Mary, and his disciples who have arrived at a wedding uh, in the Galilean town of Cana. And with any good story, uh, there is conflict that needs to be resolved uh, and if you've ever planned a wedding that, or even attended one, you know that it is inevitable that something is bound to go wrong. Uh, you hope it's not anything serious or anything uh, too big, but something's going to happen. It's just the way it goes. You know, rain during an outdoor ceremony, a toppled wedding cake, uh, a misplaced ring, heaven forbid, a ring bearer or a flower girl that just can't handle the feels. You know, uh, when Cordy and I got married, uh, my brother informed me on the morning of the ceremony that he had somehow lost the pants to his suit. You know, he was in the wedding party. We were wearing a matching suit. In fact, actually, this is the, this is the suit that I was wearing on the, the day that I got married. Well, you know, it was a great uh, bit of news that he shared with me, and it just really made me excited for the day when I found out that he was missing his pants. But uh, he, don't worry, he did get that resolved. He... That's a long story, but he did, he did eventually get a replacement pair of pants, and the wedding went on. Well, the wedding story from John's gospel is no exception, because something does indeed go wrong. In this case, the supply of wine has run out in the middle of the festivities. It's not running, it's not running low. It, it's not getting dangerously close to empty. It is finito. It is the, su the supply has run dry. Uh, you know, maybe there's something relatable, I think, in this story for readers in, in 2022. You know, how many of us are feeling parched from this pandemic? Like you've been wanting to drink deeply from life, uh, and instead your cup is feeling strangely low. You know, just dregs at the bottom, uh, a reminder of what you've been missing. Uh, for a few people, uh, it was low even before we hit this disease, and uh, I don't know if you've been feeling like this from time to time, or, or if that's how, it's, how it is now for you, uh, but I think it's fair to say that we need a word of encouragement right now. We need God's peace to step in and ease our worn out souls, amen? I think that you will find that in today's story, and in our wedding story, it is Mary who steps in. To address the problem. Verses 3 through 5 go like this. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. You know, Mary seemed to be personally invested in the problem of this lack of wine. And we're not told why. 
Uh, maybe she just doesn't want the host to be embarrassed, which is a nice gesture, I think. Or maybe she knows the celebration is what the town needs. You know, as Ken Geyer writes, for the overworked, the underpaid, and the punitively taxed, the wedding was a much-needed reprieve when they could relax with old friends and together share a little food, a little wine, a little laughter. You know, we're still, uh, it could be that Mary is personally invested because one of the newlyweds is a relative of hers, perhaps. Or perhaps she senses that it's a time, that this is the time for Jesus to begin revealing his big part in God's salvation plan. After all, Mary did give birth to God's son, raised him, and knows Jesus as a mother knows her own child. Whatever the case may be, Mary is not deterred by Jesus' response and trusts that Jesus will do something about the wine. Jewish wedding banquets during Jesus' day, uh, could, they could last up to a week. And so you, you'd have to have enough wine to get through more than just a simple four-hour reception like you do these days. Uh, wine was also uh, an everyday choice, uh, sorry, drink of choice, even outside of weddings and other festive occasions, since safe drinking water wasn't always accessible, uh, it wouldn't be uncommon for wine to be served at all meals. And, of course, let's not forget, uh, where there is a wedding, there is dancing. And let's face it, some of us are not meant to dance. God uh, didn't code it into some of our DNA. We, just, we step out on the dance floor, and our brain immediately vetoes the decision. And in those situations, when you're at a wedding and you feel compelled to, uh, to dance while fully and sincerely acknowledging that alcohol is nothing to be abused, a glass of wine can be that little boost of liquid courage that we need to stop being awkward wallflowers and to say to ourselves, the time for boogieing has come. This is going to be embarrassing, but it's going to be awesome. All jokes aside, uh, you know, biblical scholars warn us not to spiritualize or allegorize everything about this story as if the wedding or the concern of the wine were just stage props for the more important message about the great unveiling of Jesus' mission. Instead, we should pay attention for what it says about Jesus' incarnational sense of self and sense of mission. I couldn't tell you if Jesus' DNA, uh, if dancing was in Jesus' DNA, though I'd like to think it was, but I can tell you that becoming one of us most definitely was in Jesus' DNA. Like the uh, first chapter of John's Gospel tells us, the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Jesus' divine mission involves us, embracing us, connecting with us, supping with us, sharing a glass of heaven's best wine with us. And here at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, just days after his calling his disciples and the tell telling Nathaniel, you will see greater things than these, Jesus, the one who will go out uh, to give sight to the blind, cure the crippled, atone the world's sins, rise from the dead to become the firstborn of the new creation, that one kicked off his ministry by eating and celebrating with a young couple who had just been married. It says something about what is important to Jesus. Ken Geyer writes this, so characteristic of the Savior that he would first reveal his glory here in this way and for this purpose. It was not revealed at the imperial palace in Rome or Herod's temple in Jerusalem or at the colonnaded Acropolis in Athens, but here in an impoverished village of Cana, nestled away in an obscure corner of Galilee. And the way he revealed his glory with a quiet miracle. No fanfare, no footlights, no theatrics, just the mighty hand of God working silently behind the scenes in an hour of need. And the purpose of the miracle, performed not to quench his own thirst, 
but to satisfy the needs of others, to ease a tear woman's anxiety, to save a couple of starry-eyed newlyweds from, from embarrassment, and to provide a little pleasure for a work-worn community. You know, sometimes I think when we think of the glory of God, we hear glory, we, our minds go straight to the, the mysterious, the ineffable, the transcendence of God, far above our short-lived needs and desires. But the wedding of Cana tells a different story. It speaks about a, a very tangible manifestation of God's uh, right in our midst, in the very cup that we drink. And today, on the second Sunday of Epiphany, we have an opportunity to reflect on the kind of glory that is revealed in Jesus at this wedding. And I'll give you a hint. It's much closer than you might think. You know, when you're leafing through the latest issue of People magazine to catch up on the celebrity buzz, you're only peering into the lives of Hollywood stars from a distance. But the Gospel of John invites you to encounter Jesus, who gives us a very real taste of the abundant life that exists in God. Gary Neal uh, Hansen writes this, Jesus shows his glory as he honors ordinary people, quietly, wondrously tending to them. Jesus honors the bridegroom whom he saves from social disgrace. If the wine were allowed to fail, people would notice. He would uh, hear about it at every holiday dinner for the rest of his life. Jesus honors the otherwise easily ignored servants whom he makes the only real witnesses to the miracle. Jesus even honors creation, doing his miraculous work with the most basic of elements, stone in the shape of jars and water. Glory shines when the presence of the word turns the basic into the sublime. You know, when I was growing up, I had a, a neighbor down the street uh, who kept the kids in the neighborhood entertained. And every New Year's Eve and July 4th, I, was, I always got very excited because he would shoot off an obscene amount of fireworks from the end of his driveway for all of us to see. This is not the dry, dry desert. This is Clemson, South Carolina, where it rains about every day, not every day, about every week. Uh, and um, to kick off every summer, he would host a barbecue for the neighborhood and grill up an obscene amount of ribs. And he'd drive around... Uh, the neighborhood and his black Porsche 911 that all the kids drooled over. He owned a, I'm not joking, a miniature cannon that he'd shoot tennis balls out of that was so loud that it would shake all the neighborhood houses. If you didn't know anything else about this guy, if that's all you knew, you might think to yourself, that guy is extra. You know, that guy is craving attention. But I knew him, and the rest of the kids knew him as Mr. Jack who opened up his pool to anyone in the neighborhood who wanted to use it. You know, we knew him as the neighbor who told us not to worry about asking, just use it when you want it. And we did. And my friends and I used that pool every summer, all summer long, almost every day. And with every instance that we dove into the pool and had a cannonball contest or did, played Marco Polo, we never doubted that Mr. Jack wanted our neighborhood to be able to live life to the fullest. It was never about one-upping anybody or hogging the spotlight or getting attention. It was about enriching the life of the neighborhood. And likewise, when we encounter Jesus at the wedding in Cana, it becomes very clear. Jesus isn't showing off. He's not performing party tricks. He doesn't even have any intentions to do anything about the wine until his mother speaks to him. Yet when Jesus does do something about it, we start to see something beyond the ooze and the ahs of water becoming wine. In John's gospel, these wondrous events aren't called miracles. They are called signs because they point us in the right direction to discovering who Jesus is. In John 2, they hint that Jesus has come to draw us into God's abundant life that we will taste for now and experience in all of its goodness one day. And one of the best ways that John communicates this is through the description of the water-turned wine. And so verses 6 through 10 read like this. Now standing uh, there were six stone jars of water. 
uh, for the Jewish rites of purification, even holding 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. And so they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, for the servants uh, who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. You know, we are talking about a lot of wine, an amount of biblical proportions. <laughs> These are six jars. Together, they hold somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons uh, that are then filled to the brim with water, which then becomes wine. Approximately 600 to 900 bottles of wine, if you were curious. For context, the average mid-sized wedding today uses about 75 or, 75 or so bottles of wine. It's hard to say whether we are getting hard facts about the event or if the gospel writer exaggerating a little bit for narrative purposes, but either way, it's evident that Jesus is not holding back. Gail R. O. Day writes this, even taking into account the possibility of a large gathering at the wedding, the quantity of stone jars and their capacity is unusual. Everything about verse 6 is overdrawn from the description of the jars to the amount of narrative space the evangelist devotes to the description. The narrative technique mirrors the size of the jars in order to emphasize the extravagance of the miracle that is about to take place. The story invites the reader to see what the disciples see, that in the abundance and graciousness of Jesus' gift, one catches a glimpse of the identity and the character of God. You know, in this way, water uh, turns to wine, and that wine becomes a sign of Jesus' true intentions for us and our world. And as we will hear in the next chapter of, God, of John's Gospel, in the iconic line, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Hear that again with me. God so loved the world. You know, maybe you've heard that about a kajillion times in your lifetime, but it's worth repeating. God loved the world. You know, Jesus begins his ministry in the Gospel of John with a certain concrete display of God's love that is depicted both in the quantity and the quality of the wine that Jesus serves up. It's more than they need, and it's better than they've had, and that is the divine love that Jesus embodies and shares both then and today for us. You know, tomorrow will be Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and uh, I read a story this weekend about a couple who were married by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this is them, uh, Gwen and James Middlebrooks, who just celebrated their 61st anniversary. Uh, they were married on January 8th, 1961 at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, Gwen had grown up in this church uh, with King as her pastor, and, and she had also worked for, uh, uh, for his family as a nanny. And when Gwen and James were uh, both 21, they were seniors in college, they decided to get married. And uh, they'd been dating for a few years. Not only did it feel like the right time, but they realized that they could actually avoid paying for student housing and live off campus it would be cheaper. So win-win, right? So Gwen did what she would expect. You know, she goes and finds her pastor and asks uh, ask this pastor, Martin Luther King Jr., if he'd marry them. And his answer, nope. King told them he would not officiate the wedding until they gave him a good reason to marry. And she says, he kept trying to convince me that we shouldn't get married because I was too young. I'd say, you know, I'm in love. He'd say, that's not a good reason. You don't even know what love is all about. He would never give me a date because I could never come up with a reason that was good enough for him. Well, after months and months of wearing him down and asking him, she finally was able to wear him down, and King finally said yes. And so Martin Luther King Jr. gave them a date that was available, and a month later, they were married. 
Now, I suspect uh, that King was actually like a protective parent, looking out for their best interests. I suspect that as their pastor, he felt a moral obligation to guide and mentor them in their thinking as they prepared for a lifetime together. And I'm sure he was also bearing in mind that marriages often require more work and wisdom and care than you might expect at first. And for a young black couple tying the knot in Atlanta during the civil rights era, the road ahead would not likely be a stroll in the park all the time. In case in point, uh, Gwen shares in her story that they chose to only support black businesses when preparing for their wedding uh, and had trouble finding certain things, including her wedding dress. She says that everything she wore on her wedding day, we wedding day was borrowed. Gwen and James's story is a testimony that the life God wants for us can be a beautiful, deeply meaningful one, but it's not always a simple or an easy one. John Wesley uh, is quoted for saying this, Oh, let no man think his labor of love is lost, because the fruit does not immediately appear. You know, given the uh, theme of this sermon, I would phrase it like this, A grapevine is not full of grapes all year round. There are different periods of growth and harvest and dormancy. You know, for Gwen and James, January 8, 1961 would be the first day in a long journey together. It was a remarkable day, but not the end of the story. And similarly, the wine that Jesus made on that wedding day was not the climax of Jesus' ministry. It was the beginning. It was a foretaste of things to come. It was a testimony and a sign of what God was brewing, if you will. Today, we have included Holy Communion in our worship. Um, if you're worshiping online, you've already done so. And if you're here in person, we're going to be doing that after the service. And in the Gospel of John, we do not get a traditional telling of Jesus' offering of the Eucharist to the disciples. Uh, but in chapter 6, we get Jesus, the bread of life, feeding 5,000 hungry people who have gathered to hear the words of truth and life. And in chapter 2, at the wedding of Cana, we get Jesus offering up a wine so abundant and superior that it reveals the glory of God. This is the glory that will later be revealed in Jesus' suffering, in his death, and in his resurrection, perhaps foreshadowed in the beginning of our scripture today that starts with, on the third day. You know, the gospel writer holds together both struggle and joy in the same breath. Is there suffering? Will there be? Yes. But don't let that overshadow the joy and the fullness of life that this wedding story celebrates, that it talks about what God wants for us. The news of the gospel is truly good news. And when we gather for worship today, and when we take communion, we are celebrating the joy that Jesus brings in wonderful and unexpected ways. Perhaps, or just perhaps, as we take the elements, the bread of life, the cup of salvation, we will find God working within us, moving us towards that abundant life that God has started and is bringing to completion in Jesus Christ. Amen? Perhaps it may be our experience today.